Will TV be the death of us? Welcome, Mere Mortalites, to another round of the book reviews. My name is Kyron, host of the Mere Mortals podcast, but also this one where I dive deeper into the books that I'm reading to give you the juicy information that is within to extract some themes you might not have thought about and to also look at the difference between print and TV. Indeed, we do have Amusing Ourselves to Death Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business by Neil Postman. So this book was originally published in 1985 and the version I have here is the 2005 updated edition uh, with a foreword by his son, uh, Andrew Postman. And it's 163 pages in length. It took me about four hours to get through in total because it is kind of dense, the information that is contained within. Essentially, it is an argument of why TV as a medium lessens rational discourse and ultimately is a, a bad trade-off for society. And in particular, he is focusing here on American, so the United States uh, society. It is split up into two parts with neither of these being named, but the first part is really dealing with the different mediums themselves. So print versus TV, and I guess even getting into um, the spoken word. And I guess whether the information coming from these is quality and or useful. And so it is very past looking. It's looking at how did things used to be in the past versus kind of where we're getting up to nowadays. So some of the chapters in here are the medium is the metaphor, typographic America, media is epistemology, the peekaboo world. It's really looking at these things. The second is more of a how it's affecting the current society and in particular portions of this. So some of the things in here are the age of show business, shuffle off to Bethlehem, teaching as an amusing activity. So it's looking at things like politics, religion, teaching, advertising, how it is affecting us as humans and how TV in particular is degrading the experience of, I suppose, being a human in, in some certain cases or at least in terms of information and understanding. So who was Neil Postman? Well, he was American, born in New York City, I believe, or at least he lived a lot of his life there. And he lived from 1931 to 2003. So he actually has missed out on a large portion of what has been happening in the last 30 years. He was, I suppose, a technophobe, if you want to be kind of a person who didn't like technology, for sure, with caveats to this. He wasn't a hardliner. Uh, and this book was based originally on a talk at a book fair that he did in the year before 1984, which was uh, all about Huxley versus Orwell. So the two uh, great, I suppose, dystopian novels of the of the uh, 20th century, this being Brave New World and 1984, 1984, my favorite book of all time. And he's really focusing about, OK, how this is actually more, we're turning more into the Huxley Brave New World type of deal uh, rather than the Orwellian um, draconian type one. So uh, just a little interesting piece of info there. I'm going to get onto the first theme and this being the medium, the way information is conveyed. So one of the title chapters is the medium is the metaphor. And this is a slight play on words of something we might have all heard before, which is the medium is the message. And what this basically is, is it's saying that the medium itself, so in this case, we'll just use something like the spoken word or TV or written text or even things like pamphlets or books, and you can get more granular and niche with it. Uh, the medium is, itself is, is what is being conveyed. That is what it means. So the message is somewhat uh, dictated by that. And then also the medium dictates what it contains. And so uh, if, an easy way of thinking about this is TV is inferior to print for, for some certain types of discourse and things like uh, smoke, smoke signals, which the Native Americans used to use, you're not going to have a philosophical treatise contained within that. It's impossible to, to have that amount <laughs> of, of detail and meaning being conveyed through smoke signals. We can also look at things like uh, juries. They are not allowed to write down what certain people are saying during the actual jury and have transcripts of that because when you have that in front of you the, the meaning of words of what people are saying can actually change dramatically and so that's actually part of the the law and the legal system so we see okay the medium itself and the metaphor that it contains uh, and this is kind of just really examining okay the, the the message and the medium the metaphor they're all kind of combined and certain 
aspects of television versus print are going to change. And I think we could all probably agree on that. Now, what are the things, one of the things that matters with this is truth and, and how do they compare with truths? And he had this really interesting anecdote here from a student who was presenting a thesis or something like that. And they were giving an oral version of this. And in they also had in this, uh, as accompanying this, or the oral version was accompanying the main written text. And uh, he had a little quote in there, which was from something he had been told in person. And then he used that as a reference, as a citation saying, uh, as told by the investigator in the presence of da, da, da on certain date. And the people who were uh, judging this brought this up. And so I'll go over to here. And so he's asking, why do you assume the accuracy of a print reference citation, but not a speech referenced one? So why, why is this not as valid? And so in response, they say, the answer he received took the following line. You are mistaken in believing that the form in which an idea is conveyed is irrelevant to its truth. In the academic world, the published word is invested with greater prestige and authenticity than the spoken word. What people say is assumed to be more casually uttered than what they write. The written word is assumed to have been reflected upon and revised by its author, reviewed by authorities and editors. It is easier to verify or refute, and it is invested with an impersonal and objective character, which is why no doubt you have referred to yourself in your thesis as the investigator and not by your name. That is to say, the written word is, by its nature, addressed to the world, not an individual. The written word endures, the spoken word disappears, and that is why writing is closer to the truth than speaking. Moreover, we are sure you would prefer that this commission produce a written statement that you have passed your examination, should you do so, than for us to merely tell you that you have and leave it at that. Our written statement would represent the truth. Our oral agreement would only be a rumor. So this is one of those cases where we can see, okay, in certain cases, uh, and by and large, you would probably say written uh, text can contain elements of truth. And this is very hard to get into because it is very easy to to lie in books and to lie in uh, things like this. And we can see also online in this digital age with chat GPT, just being able to write stuff out. Okay, just because something is written doesn't necessarily mean that it is closer to the truth. But I think it's when you start comparing these things and you can look at quality versus quantity. And in this case, uh, we see on page six, uh, 68, He's also talking about one of the things that was happening when the Telegraph came out was there was just this abundance of information of news coming from all across uh, America. You know, if you were in Chicago, you could now get information from the middle of Minneapolis or wherever the hell it is. And so uh, it was basically just saying, you know, for investors, news of the stock market, perhaps an occasional story about crime will do it. Does any of these actually affect you and and this is getting i guess not only just from the truth but also to how what you can do with this information and with this truth is it useful and so do you act on the news cycle and it's really interesting because he's essentially saying that tv by and large and he's writing this in 1985 so he had you know just to put yourself in the television of the 1980s 1970s is what he's really talking about he's he's essentially arguing the the truth that you can find in this tv is is not as good as you can find in other mediums and in particular in the print medium and that the ability to act on this is less useful as well so do you act on the news that, that you hear about an earthquake or a tsunami on the other side of the world um you know maybe maybe you send in some money to a charity um and this is where it's getting into some questions for myself about what he would think about current uh, TV mediums. And this is where we have things like YouTube and not only in, in particular, he was against TV, which I think you can kind of take as a, uh, as a synonym or as a, in, in his words would be for video. He was very much against video, whereas I would be really intrigued to know what does he think of how-to videos on YouTube? Is that a useful medium for conveying a message, which I would argue is a, a fantastic. It's, it's much more helpful than something like text. So a lot of what he's talking about is really trying to convey the message that one, 
the medium can change things very dramatically, which I think is pretty easy to understand. Most of us would be able to, to get that. And his arguments are that by and large print is better than the medium of television and in this case television being video so that's i suppose the first section of the book the first part of it is is wrapped up in with that the second is now getting onto the second theme which is amusements the seriousness of huxleyan mindlessness and so why is, is seriousness important this word just crops up constantly in this book and it's 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 very much a, a focus on his mind I'm going to jump now onto page 50, where I think this is his explanation of, of why seriousness is important. So we go to here. Uh, it is serious because meaning demands to be understood. A written sentence calls upon its author to say something, upon its reader to know the import of what is said. And when an author and reader are struggling with semantic meaning, they are engaged in the most serious challenge to the intellect. This is especially the case with the act of reading, for authors are not always trustworthy. They lie, they become confused, they overgeneralize, they abuse logic, and sometimes common sense. The reader must come armed and in a state of serious intellectual readiness. This is not easy because he comes to the text alone. In reading, one's responses are isolated, one is one's intellect thrown back on its own resources. To be confronted by the cold abstractions of print and sentences is to look upon language bare without the assistance of either beauty or community. Thus reading by its nature uh, is by thus reading is by its nature a serious business. It is also, of course, an essentially rational activity. And then he goes on to talk more about why this rationality is, is important. And yeah, essentially reading in, in his case is a proxy for rationality and it's a, and rationality is, is somewhat of a boon to humanity. What distinguishes us from the animals living, you know, bear out in nature, having to deal with all of the horrible things, tooth claw, you know, the hierarchical structure of just random death and things like this. It's rationality and we can use this to our advantage and arguably make the world a better place. I hope we can all agree on that. And what he says is, okay, well, TV affects us and it is taking us away from this rationality and moving us more into the amusements. So how does this crop up? Well, we can see this with politics where it becomes more about the appearance of someone and not the ideas. So he gives examples of people, US presidents in the past, they used to be able to walk the streets of random towns and no one would know who they were. But if you saw their written text or you started to hear them speech, you might be able to understand, oh, okay, this is this person um, and they rose to being president of the United States or whatever because of their ideas, not necessarily of their physical appearance. TV obviously has a very dramatic impact of this and the famous cases of uh, Nixon versus Kennedy where Kennedy was this you know younger, more youthful looking guy, more handsome and uh, people who watched the debates between Nixon and Kennedy, Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy, they when they watched on TV, they would argue that um, Kennedy won because he knew how to act in front of a camera he knew how to address people. He was better looking. He was more in shape. Nixon, not so much. He had, you know, shiny, he didn't have makeup on. He didn't do all of these things. And then people who listened via the radio, and so just the, the words that they were actually speaking, uh, speaking, thought that Nixon did better and that John F. Kennedy came off the worst in that. So you can definitely see, okay, the same information is roughly being conveyed with the additional on the video of those inputs. And it can dramatically impact what people think of essentially the same thing that is happening, i.e. the truth. So was the truth more true in the radio context or was it more true in the video context? Who's, who's to say? Uh, in this case, he was saying when you're getting more into appearance and not on ideas, you're taking away from rationality and you are becoming more about something that is it's not irrational, but it is just a, it's not as, as useful. So the appearance of someone is maybe not as useful as the uh, ideas that they propound and, uh, and, and that they put forth. Another case would be education. And so this is where it's arguing that TV is trying to make it more of a passive activity versus one which is active. And there's all of these commandments which are used on TV which don't carry well for educating someone. And so some of the commandments are 
uh, thou shalt have no prerequisites. So every television program must be a complete package in itself. It can't have any additional information before that. It is almost assuming someone needs to come in fresh. So you can't build upon things, which is how humanity typically works. We build upon the shoulders of giants. Uh, thou shalt not, uh, thou shalt induce no perplexity. So in this case, it's saying perplexity, putting things that are paradoxical into the information that is being contained in the TV medium is a big no, no. You don't want to do that. That takes away from the amusement, the enjoyment of people. And so they will not watch the TV show as much as, as, uh, as another one. And so you can't have any nuance in, in TV. And thou shalt avoid exposition like the 10 plagues visited upon Egypt. And so this was one where it's saying, you know, arguments, hypotheses, discussions, reasons, refutations, or any of the traditional in, uh, instruments of reason discourse turn de television into radio or worse, third rate printed matter. And so he's saying, okay, if you want to introduce aspects of rationality of, dis of good discourse into television, you're actually taking it away from being the television medium, which is focused prim primarily on amusement, on entertainment. And I don't think he would argue that entertainment and amusement is bad in the, the widest context of is this good or bad for humanity. I think he's just arguing that it's gotten to a point where TV has maybe gotten a bit too much <laughs> uh, reach, a bit too much power a bit too much amusement and that it, it might be better to have more rational discourse and more um, thoughtful uh, things being in, uh, it being a larger part of society. Uh, we see this with religion as well, which is where it's turned religion into this theater. It's spectacle of, <laughs> of priests and people zip lining down in their mega churches down to the stage of you know, creating these singing concerts of having a band up on stage and uh, all of this stuff, which is makes it more entertaining for sure. But is this the original point of the religious experience? Is this getting to the heart of the deeper meaning that can be found than what religion is, is meant to do for people? And he argues no. And then finally, he also has a section on advertisements. And if you've listened to the mere mortals at all, you will know I'm not a big fan of, of advertisements. So anything that rails against them is um, I, I, I usually am drawn to. And so we go to here on page 104 and 105, which I think has a really good explanation of why the advertisement, another reason why advertisements are, are unhelpful to them. So, he says, why then do we not think a news uh, show similarly unworthy? The reason I believe is that whereas we expect books and even other media such as film to maintain a consistency of tone and a continuity of content, we have no such expectation of television and especially television news. We have become so accustomed to its discontinuities that we are no longer struck dumb as any sane person would be by a newscaster who, who having just reported that a nuclear war is inevitable goes on to say that he will be right back after this word from Burger King, who says, in other words, now dot, 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 this. And that is the chapter of that title, now dot, 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 this, which is getting into, if you're in a, <laughs> a rational discourse with someone in your everyday life and you're talking about something and then they just absolutely interrupt the sentence and say, oh, yeah, but have you seen the latest Barbie movie? And you're talking about why your grandmother is dying of cancer and why you won't be able to attend this event or do this thing that discontinuity that jump that perspective change is very bizarre and i assume most people have met someone crazy in their life who, who kind of does something like this and it and it's a very jarring experience and what he's saying is that uh, tv immune uh, immunizes ourselves to this very, very strange thing that happens because that is what it does with the television commercials, with the changing from one topic to the next of the news cycle. All of this plays into this uh, idea, I guess, of that TV is more about amusement and entertainment, which in a take into its uh, logical extremes will get us into the Huxleyan type idea of the mindlessness. And so right at the end of the book, he's talking about, okay, why was the Huxleyan uh, dystopia, why was that so dystopic of, of Brave New World? And so he says, um, 
uh, that we are in a race between education and disaster. And he wrote continuously. Um, so here we go. For in the end, he was trying to tell us that what afflicted the people in Brave New World was not that they were laughing instead of thinking, but that they did not know what they were laughing about and why they had stopped thinking. And yeah, so this, I think, uh, conveys his thoughts. Laughter, entertainment, amusements are not a bad thing in of themselves, but they're a bad thing if you're not sure of why it's happening and also if it is taking away from rationality that you could be using in other cases. He doesn't get there himself in this book, but I would argue that the reason for this is something like consciousness and that TV and things like this, and I'll apply this to the modern context of uh, something like TikTok, it is largely based on amusements and amusements are, I feel, a, a mind-numbing thing that they, they kind of take away from consciousness. It, it makes you more of a robot and the people creating the content perhaps a, a robotic in their nature as well. And NPC live streaming is a classic, uh, very recent example of this. Um, so does the the idiot box, the TV as well, the idiot box is what my father used to call it. Does this promote consciousness? Do, do when you listen to it or well, watch it, do you come out of it with a higher level of consciousness of, of rationality, of understanding, of nuance, of perspective? By and large, probably not. Most shows are not designed for that. Most shows are designed to entertain and amuse. So that is, is his essential arguments in the two in the in the book. The medium, the message is very important, and that TV as as a medium and a message is inferior to uh, print and text for society at large. Um, I, I want to stress that this book, is very nuanced. And so what I'm trying to convey here is, is not that this guy was railing against uh, TV and, you know, just shooting from the hip going like, bam, 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 TV bad. You know, I once saw a kid watch TV for 10 hours and then he turned into a serial killer. It's no, it's not like anything like that. <laughs> so let's go to my own personal observations and takeaways. It's a good question to ask because a book like this, especially with this title, is a, a somewhat provocative. You know, was he a technophobe? Did, was this just an old grumpy guy uh, who didn't like technology? You know, there's a slight aspect of that. Um, I was reading up on him, and he did have these. It seemed a general opinion that technology was a a, a bad thing, I guess, but. And he himself, he indulged, indulged in hyperbole, for example, amusing ourselves to death. There's nothing about this in this book about death. There's nothing in this that is implying that uh, we're all going to die because we listen to TV or, or watch TV and it has become more important in our lives. Um, there's nothing about that. So obviously the title itself is a bit hyperbolic. Uh, he's somewhat hypocritical. He appeared on TV shows to promote his book, to talk about these ideas. So once again, he's indulging in this thing that he is talking against. But one of the things I do like about him was that he appreciated paradox and that and that uh, it wasn't an either or, it was more of a an and. And so I actually watched a snippet of him on, on YouTube on, on a television show uh, where he was saying, you know, it's not either or, it's about the Faustian trade-offs of, okay, you can get this thing, you can have this thing which will... Uh, be able to connect, uh, promote uh, understanding, learning. You can learn more about the world. You can see visual. This is all information that you can you can't get elsewhere. But that there are trade offs for this, and it, and it's important to be mindful of what these trade offs are. And you know, this is a case where I actually watched this. I I watched a video of him, and it was a good trade off for me because I learned more about him. Um, it sure it condensed his views into a nine minute segment of him on a TV show, but it gave me ideas more about his speech patterns, about how he communicated, how he thought. And I went, oh, I actually like this guy, guy better. And he's not that in slight impression I might have had in my mind of being a tech old grumpy technophobe. No, he was he was a uh, he was a real person who, uh, with additional context, I appreciated more about him. So yeah, that was that was a, a kind of just nice observation where it's it's not useful to get caught up in this person is in this box. Don't it's best not to put him or or, or this book in a box. I think, but to uh, understand and appreciate some of the nuances. 
another thing I really liked of this was his kind of inquisitive nature. And so just jumping here on a page 13, where he's kind of just summarizing uh, a bunch of things about Plato, about uh, text. And he was uh, saying how uh, Plato was surmising about the consequences of writing. And so just jumping onto the end here, people like ourselves may see nothing wondrous in writing, but our anthropologists know how strange and magical it appears to a purely oral people, a conversation with no one and yet with everyone. What could be stranger than the silence one encounters when addressing a question to a text? What could be more metaphysically puzzling than addressing an unseen audience as every writer of books must do? and correcting oneself because one knows that an unknown reader will disapprove or misunderstand. When you put it in that context, it is very, very strange. Another good book that I'd recommend is uh, uh, Watch Out There Are Snakes, I think is what it's called by Daniel Everett, something like that. And it, this was about him going to a, one of these uncontacted tribes in the uh, Amazon jungle, I believe, and they had no text. And even the way they communicated was not in the sense of, I believe the grammatical structure of their language didn't really allow for things, the concept of I, it was always the group. And this was because it was a tiny tribe. I think it was a hundred people or something. And so he was trying to learn the language and how they communicated to be able to translate the Bible. Funnily enough, that's one of the missionaries of one of the, the greatest uh, linguists out there because they had to go to all these places in the world and, and understand the language to then be able to translate the Bible. That was their, their purpose. And yeah, for in this case, I mean, there's probably no point of him even translating it because it would be, they didn't even know how to read and, and write. So what is this strange book, which is telling me things and trying to communicate out at me and also at this person over here, it is very bizarre. And when you look at the words on, written on a page, much like if you look at hieroglyphic symbols, it becomes very, very different. And you go, oh, like, what is this thing? How is this method and medium trying to communicate me, communicate at me? Was it a person? Was it an entity? Are they addressing me as a person or as an entity as part of a collective? It can be very, very strange. And uh, the last little observation thing I wanted to take away was, you know, what would he think and what can we do nowadays when we have these mediums, which are even more ridiculous than the television that he was experiencing. Uh, and it's even funny because the updated version by the, his son, I think was published in the early 2000s. So it didn't even have the full gamut of YouTube videos, of podcasts, of just information 100x, 1000x, 10,000x of what they were experiencing. And the only thing that I could really take that I learned from this book was uh, just be mindful about it. If you want to use these things, you know, go nuts. It's awesome. But just be mindful that every time that you're using a TikTok or a, for entertainment and, and, and amusements, it might be taking away from some rationality that you could be applying elsewhere in your life. And that on the whole, this might not be great for society. Would I ascribe to that? Uh, I'd need to think about that more, but it's a it's an interesting concept nonetheless. So in summary, I really love this book. It was a great book, but I will acknowledge it's only for certain people. For one, you're going to need a broad base of just general understanding, learning to start off with. He goes about Plato. He talks about Bible and old religious texts. He talks about the Gutenberg press. So you need to know about history. He'll go deeper into US presidents and US context, things that are particular to that. And then modern things, talking about Sesame Street, talking about uh, you know, news television stations of popular news hosts. It It's a very wide, expansive book. So you need to kind of have a, a pretty broad, broad base just to start off with. Um, I think you'll like this if you're fascinated by communication in general. So maybe if you're in the media business, uh, if you're into marketing and getting a message across to people, telling stories, if you are interested in language learning and how communication can change across various languages and various different mediums. I think these are all the sorts of things the people who would enjoy a book like this. If you're even interested in society and large broad sweeps and how individuals can change based just upon what is happening in a society, this is probably the book for you. If you're not, I could see you really hating this book because it'll 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 just be uh, it'll sound too weighty, it'll sound too philosophical, it won't be practical, it'll it'll just go yeah. I I could see myself 
10 years in the past being like, I don't, I don't like this book. So you'll need to think about a lot of things for it is definitely a thinking book. And, um, it's probably one that I will come back to. And I definitely want to read some more from this author, Neil Postman. So all in all, I'm giving the book amusing ourselves to death, public discourse in the age of show business by Neil Postman and eight and a half out of 10. I loved it. I really did enjoy it. And it gave me a lot of ideas to take off into other aspects of my own podcasting life and, and uh, things like this. So that is it for today, my mere mortal lights. Thank you for joining me to the end of this video of this medium. What are your thoughts on the medium as the message on the metaphor on this book? If you have read it on Neil Postman on being a technophobe, all those sorts of things. Best way of doing this is just by leaving a comment. I really enjoy the long detailed comments that I tend to get on this channel, which are, is a much nicer compared to some of the others with which have shorts and things like this. So yeah, I, uh, I really do enjoy those and I uh, definitely like to acknowledge you and thank you when I do the end of month book recaps. If you, if you leave a, a, a nice, uh, thoughtful comment, it's, um, it's something I really appreciate. If you want to do the other things like subscribe that that helps out the channel as well and uh you know makes it more accessible to other people and yeah uh other than that i would just recommend checking out the mere mortals podcast uh i take a lot of the ideas from these books and i have a conversation so once again a different medium uh with my friend juan so the the link for that should be appearing on your screen and it's down below as well reach out to me join our discord do any of that stuff and if you want to monetarily help support this show, I'm never gonna have advertising in here. I'm never gonna do paywalls. I'm never going to do sponsorships or anything like that. So I would just ask that if you can do that, uh, there's a PayPal link and then these um, on these podcasting apps, I also do put this out as an audio only version. Uh, you can go and, and check them out and there's um, various cool ways of, of helping to support via there as well. So. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that for today. Thank you very much for joining me. And I do hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. Ciao for now. Karen out. Boom, boom, boom.